Hi, I'm Max Blumenthal for The Real News. We're here at the National Press Club at the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs conference examining whether the special relationship between the U.S. and Israel is good for America. Um, and I'm here with Gideon Levy. Uh, Gideon Levy was the former spokesman for Shimon Peres, former Israeli president, and is now one of the most outspoken journalists in Israel, uh, someone who I would say is a true dissident in Israeli society and the voice of uh, the voiceless in Israel, uh, people, Israelis who are resisting occupation and resisting apartheid. Um, and we're going to talk to Gideon um, not only about the U.S. and Israeli special relationship, but also about what's happening in Israeli society right now. Um, Gideon, you uh, spoke earlier today, and you said that if, any, um, if you could show any American visiting the Holy Land anything, you would first take them to Hebron. And I think you're referring to H2, the section of the city that is honeycombed with very violent radical settlers, um, but is still Palestinian. Uh, why would you show them that area? There's so much to see. I would start there because there you'll get it in a nutshell. There's no other place where you can see the Israeli policy, the Israeli apartheid in the West Bank in such crystal clear colors. Yeah. Roads which are separated for Jews and for Palestinians. Yeah. An empty town because all the Palestinian inhabitants had to run away. I mean, the settlers tyrannized them so much right. until most of them, they really remained only those who have no place to go. Right. And you see the tyranny of the settlers, their brutality. They are the most extreme settlers are there. Part of them should be questioned by psychiatrists. I mean, really, and all in a very small piece of land. And that's the way it could have, and it will look one day, if this occupation will continue. So yeah. you get it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah, it's like a microcosm of Absolutely. the whole occupation. Absolutely, I and I know no one, who, any honest person, who had been ever there and wasn't shocked. Um, and you know, I, I was on Shuhada Street, yeah. uh, standing around talking to the soldiers, and we we're talking about a few hundred settlers guarded by hundreds and hundreds of soldiers who also are very violent with the local Palestinian population. I'm standing there, I'm filming, and a, and a settler woman walks by and she's, she's just staring at me. And I just go, yalla, you know, get out of here. And she goes, what do you mean, yalla? What are you talking about? And she has a Brooklyn accent. And that was incredible to me. I think what you would hear there are New York accents in the middle of Hebron. So, how do you think the U.S. has helped create that situation in Hebron? The U.S. is the big financer of the Zionist project and the big financer of the settlement project. Yeah. Without the U.S., there is no occupation. Right. And the U.S. carries responsibility for any of Israel's deeds and crimes because without the U.S., Israel couldn't do it very clearly. Um, the U.S claims that Israel is its ally in the region, um, that Israel actually serves a geostrategic purpose. Um, do, do, do you see it that way? Do you think Israel's actually, and under Israel, especially under Netanyahu, um, really cares what the U.S. thinks? First of all, many times, if one is watching the relations between Israel and the United States, comes up the question, who is the superpower? Is it Israel or is it the United States? Who yeah. dictates to whom? Who blackmails whom? Yeah. And in many times, you get the impression that Israel is blackmailing the United States. And here I come and I ask myself, why? That's an enigma for me. How come that Israel is so powerful? And the other question one should ask himself is, what does interest serve in terms of American either interest or values? Yeah. Occupation is American values? Occupation serves the American interest. Doesn't America see that it pays a hell of a price for this automatic and blind support of Israel and of the occupation project? Is it reasonable that in the 21st century, the United States will finance an apartheid regime in the occupied territories? All those questions should be raised, but 
I, I'm not sure anyone has an answer. Well, we don't have anyone in our media here, in our mainstream media, who raises them. And you at least are at Haaretz, you have a column. Um, you know, talk about your own experiences raising these issues, raising the uncomfortable and really disturbing issues of occupation, apartheid, and how it's creeping back into Jewish-Israeli society. How's that affected you over the past years, especially since Netanyahu has been in power? The recent years, it became less and less pleasant and maybe even less and less secure. As you might know, there was a certain time during the last war in Gaza in which I even had to be accompanied by uh, bodyguards. It's to be let's leave alone me because I'm just one individual. What really matters is that to speak for consciousness, to speak for morality, to speak for maintaining the international law is perceived in Israel as treason, not less than this. The worst curse that you can hear today is you are a leftist. That's yeah. a curse in Israel. This atmosphere, violent, aggressive, and lacking any kind of tolerance, is above all dangerous for the future of Israel. Yeah. Uh, where do you see the future going? You have a culture minister, Miri Regev, who is demanding uh, a kind of loyalty oath from artists. Um, actually, an artist friend of mine, Natalie Voxberg Cohen, has been jailed or uh, indicted for her art. Um, in the school system, you're seeing very strong um, imposition of um, re religious nationalist indoctrination and militarism. Um, the youth in polls seem to be more racist than their parents and grandparents were talking about the Jewish Israeli youth. Um, and it doesn't seem like the occupation is coming to an end. It actually seems like a future component of Israel. So where do you, where do you see it going over the next five or ten years and how long can you hold on? First of all, American liberals should know all this. They should know that they are supporting first sign of fascism in Israel. I don't call it yet fascism, but first sign of signs, very clear, first signs of fascism. And America is behind it. Yeah. And America is supporting it. Yeah. Is Amer and America keeps one blind eye to it. And America keeps financing it. This should be known and should be really recognized by any American, mainly the liberals, who care where the taxpayer money goes, and so much of it. Now, where does it go? I can't imagine myself one hopeful scenario. You name it, I mean, there is no source of hope right now. There's no alternative to Netanyahu, and the alternative which might replace him is not any better. Atmosphere, as I said, is becoming less and less tolerant. Understanding of democracy is minimal and many times very twisted. People think that democracy, most of the Israelis think that democracy means the rule of the majority and all the rest is totally unimportant. Levels of ignorance, which I never saw before, the young generation of Israel, you might know it, reached level of ignorance. They know nothing about nothing and they care nothing about nothing which should worry above all Israelis before anyone else. But I don't see Israelis worry about it. And then we had this hope that the United States will change. We had a huge hope seven years ago. This hope was totally misleading. And finally, we are seven years with Barack Obama, who did nothing in the Middle East. He was a great president, I'm sure. It's not for me to judge. But when it comes to the Middle East, he did nothing. And you are really hopeless. The only source of hope is that in many cases in history, the unexpected happen. In many cases, rotten regimes fall by itself. And there is nothing more rotten than the Israeli occupation. A lot of the uh, younger Jewish Israeli activists, they started to kind of go into the West Bank through this loosely knit group, Anarchists Against the Wall, and they would join Palestinians in the small villages, Nabi Saleh, Berlin, and so on. Um, and that's, you know, that whole um, cooperation, I feel like it's, it's been crushed by the military and the P Palestinian Authority, and I see a lot of them who I've known since that period moving into the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. 
and they're behind a group called Boycott from Within. Um, they're basically calling to the outside world and saying, boycott my country. Um, why are they doing that? And what do you think of the prospects for the BDS movement? Do you think this might be potentially a game changer um, in, in prov and provide some hope? First of all, I can't blame those young people as devoted, as courageous they, as they are. They were crashed, not only by the Israeli army, also by the Israeli media, which delegitimizes them on a systematic basis. Yeah. And really their voice was really, their mouth was shut, practically. Either delegitimization in the media or really physical attacks by the army. And you know, week after week, and um, they lost hope in many ways. The only hopeful tool right now, the only game in town which might show some kind of hope is BDS. It's a non-violent tool, a very legitimate one. It was proven extremely effective vis-a-vis -vis apartheid South Africa. And there is no reason in the world why it wouldn't be applied also toward Israel, as long as Israel is continuing to, to, to stand behind all those crimes and the, behind the occupation, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, most Israelis see BDS as it's tantamount to destroying Israel. I mean, how, how, would you, how do you respond to them when they say, oh, it's just another way of throwing us into the sea? Nothing will destroy Israel more than the occupation. And those who care about the future of Israel should better do something about the occupation. That's the biggest enemy of Israel. That's the biggest danger for Israel, morally, politically, economically, and militarily. Anyone who thinks that Israel will live on its sword forever just doesn't know anything about history because there was no empire which lasted forever, living only on its sword. And BDS has a very concrete goal, and this is to put an end to the occupation. It's a very legitimate goal. It's a moral goal. And, uh, and, and I wish I wouldn't say so, but I don't see anything more effective than this. Right. Um, let me ask you about your own political development. As I mentioned in the intro, you were um, a member of the Labor Party in good standing. Um, you were close to Shimon Perez. You were close to the whole peace process and the peace camp. Um, and there's an incredible scene from a short documentary um, by a friend of ours, Iran Torbiner, where you're in the old Labor Party headquarters and it's completely empty and kind of being demolished. And it's a symbol for the Labor Party today. The Labor Party today under Isaac Herzog is proposing a plan to do away with the two-state solution that it used to really define itself on. So how did you get to where you are supporting the BDS movement and how did the Labor Party get to this point, supporting Netanyahu's goals? I think I made a long journey. I'm not sure that Labor changed. Yeah. Finally, Labor was always what it is today. There were times in which we believed the bluff, or I believed the bluff. But by the end of the day, Labor carries more responsibility for the occupation than any other political group in Israel. They put the foundations. They, take, they did nothing to put an end to the occupation ever. The only evacuation of occupied territories were made by Sharon, not by anyone of labor. So by the end of the day, labor didn't change. Right. And Herzog is a typical leader of labor, like Shimon Peres, like Rabin. Oslo, in my view, was a trap. It, and it was never aimed to put an end to the occupation. And the proof is that it never evacuated one settlement. And without evacuation of settlements, your intentions are very, very transparent. You don't mean to put an end to the occupation. And as for myself, this shift that I went through is due only to one thing, to the fact that I started to cover the occupation to travel week after week, many times day after day, for 30 years, over 30 years. Yeah. And what I witnessed, very few Israelis had witnessed. And nobody with conscience could stick to any other 
consequences and conclusions, but radical conclusion that this occupation must come to its end unconditionally yeah. and immediately because yeah. it is criminal. Yeah. Um, since we're in Washington, um, a place where many people are unfamiliar with the images you would see on a weekly basis just traveling 30 minutes from your home. Right. Um, people here, it's, information about this is very hard to get. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you sense when you, when, you, when, you get, when you come here to this town? Um, do you talk to any people who are in Congress? Do you talk to congressional aides? Do you ever get summoned to talk to anyone with any influence on policy, on foreign policy in the U.S.? Unfortunately not. Many years ago when I was more with the mainstream, I had more, more opportunities to meet legislators and officials I'm, I'm really banned here. I mean, nobody would talk to me. Not that I tried, I never tried. But I don't feel any interest in my views. American media, most of it. American politicians, legislatures, diplomats. They don't seem, I think, it's much of a challenge for them to face my views. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> exactly. Um, what, what, what role do you see APAC and the pro-Israel lobby playing in making, in, in the transformation of Jewish-Israeli society, where, where you say the stages of fascism are, are beginning? Let's talk about the Phoenicians. I claim that APAC is an anti-Israeli organization, not a pro-Israeli organization. They corrupt Israel. Not only them, but they start this whole process which enable Israel to continue the occupation with no limitations, with no restrictions. They stand behind this terrible phenomena in which a state like Israel, which is very well off, well equipped, very strong, gets this enormous sums of money year after year, which corrupts Israel. This American money that APAC is responsible for getting it, this money corrupts Israel. And therefore, in my view, APAC is not only not pro-Israel, in my view, APAC is one of the biggest enemies of the state of Israel. Sheldon Adelson would disagree. <laughs> I guess, but not only on this. He would uh, disagree on anything I say. Well. Yeah, he doesn't seem to believe Palestinians exist. So. I'm so proud to be different than Sheldon Edelson. So proud. I hope that I get that distinction as well. Um, just last question, wrapping up, because um, we're you know it's campaign season. Um, what kind of um, how do you, how do you feel about the U.S. presidential campaign? There's going to be a walkout at APAC against Donald Trump by some of the figures that you've accused of. Uh, per perverting Israeli society. Hillary Clinton is sort of the, you know, challenger of Trump, the presumptive challenger of Trump, but she uh, is also someone who's winning a lot of support from the pro-Israel lobby and win reaping a lot of donations. So do you see any hope or anything coming out of this um, election campaign? First of all, if I had to choose between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, concerning the Middle East, not concerning yeah. other issues. Concerning the Middle East, I'd rather vote for Donald Trump. With Hillary Clinton, we know very well. This means the continuous of the support, the automatic blind support in the occupation, in Israel, in all its crimes, in all the attacks. I mean, Clinton is the worst. Donald Trump is unknown. Yeah. Might be a catastrophe. But until now, he said some interesting things, like wanting to be neutral. Yeah. That's, That's outrageous. Pretty radical. That's out to be neutral. I mean, I don't think he's a man of justice. I don't think he's a man of morality. I don't think he cares at all. He cares at all about the Palestinians. He hardly knows who they are. Really, I, you look at this and you look at this and you understand that the Middle East is now doomed to another four or eight years of stagnation, of 
developing and strengthening the occupation even more. Nothing will come from Washington, for sure not from the official. And therefore, again, we are getting back to the important role of civil society. Yeah. Because when this is the administration, the only hope will be from campuses, of universities, from public opinion, from activists, from NGOs, and from individuals who will raise their voice against. Yeah. Um, how do you avoid burning out or going crazy? Um, mm. How are you going to survive the next four to eight years? Because I'm, I'm asking for myself. Okay. You know, I, I, who told I you I'm going to survive? I'm not sure. <laughs> Listen, seriously, it's much easier than you think. Because when you really believe in what you do, you have no other choice. It's not like I can make a choice. I don't have any other choice. This is what I believe. This is my profession to write. This is the mission I took upon myself. And nobody can uh, change it unless, you know, I'll be expelled, I'll be jailed, I'll be killed, I'll, I don't know what. But as long as I am free to choose, nothing will stop me. Well, I can just tell you um, when I started making the transition from covering domestic politics to writing about Israel-Palestine, it was your voice during Operation Cast Lead in 2008, 2009 that really helped me. Uh, that Thank really you. encouraged me, and I think there are countless other people who feel the same. So, just as a word of encouragement in closing. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank a lot. you, Max. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah.